Hello, good afternoon. Pleasure to be here, thank you for inviting me. And I'm here to answer a question. And the question is, what is the point of happiness? Uh, the answer is life. You have already heard about life today. One of my physicist colleagues told you that maybe there was no point to the universe, but there was certainly a point of life. And the point of life is very simple. It's something that we have constructed ourselves, something that we have constructed with our feeling, our consciousness, the fact that we reflect on what happens to us, and that has allowed us to give a meaning to our life. Now, happiness is absolutely vital in order to be able to give meaning to our life. So, in order to tell you a little bit about this, uh, I have to explain first what I think happiness is. And you might think, well, is it joy? Is it uh, something else? Uh, now, it's very difficult to define and to explain what happiness is, but I'm going to try. Uh, and I would say that happiness is a state of being that is both physical and mental, and which depends on three major components, and you, you're quite familiar with them. One is well-being, another is joy, another is a personal reflection that you make on that state. Is this ability beyond well-being, beyond joy, of thinking about you are experiencing, thinking about the fact that something has happened to you and that something is happening to you now that you experience as happiness. And that is absolutely critical for you to, uh, in fact, have that feeling of happiness. Now, of course, there are many varieties of happiness. Uh, you may actually not feel joy all the time. In fact, we normally don't. We're not bursting with joy every day and every hour. And you may feel all of that with different intensities. And you may reflect sometimes more, sometimes less. But essentially, what is important is that all those ingredients are present in what we call happiness, and that is the theme of this session. So, why did I say that the point of happiness was life? That is because there is something very special about these feelings that I just described, about the feeling of well-being or the feeling of joy. And that has to do with the fact that they are reports, mental reports, on the state of our life that appear in our mind. So when you, when you say to yourself, I feel well, I have a state of well-being. What, what is really happening is that there are signals from your body that are reporting to your brain and therefore allowing to have in your mind the idea that, in fact, your life is going well. Your life is making progress. Your life is in a state that is conducive for you to survive and even possibly for you to flourish. And what that really means is that it's not only what is happening in your body, in your health, for example, right now, but something else that is equally important in this state of happiness, and that has to do with how you are in the social space. Don't forget that we are imminently social creatures. We don't depend on ourselves only. We depend on others as well. And how we relate to others, how others relate to us, what we think of others, what others think of us, is absolutely essential for us to understand what we're really all about. Now, how did this ability of self-knowledge, that is really what I'm talking about, come, you know, came to be? Uh, and in reality, this is a big mystery. It is the mystery of feeling. Uh, and we happen to know a little bit about it, so I'm going to share it with you with the proviso that you understand that some of these things are not fully worked out yet. It's not that science has come up with a full understanding of what is feeling, what is in fact conscious feeling. But one thing that we know quite well is that life, and life has existed on our planet for about four billion years, not thousands of years, not millions, billions of years, Life had to be regulated, and whether we're talking about an amoeba or a bacterial cell, that little organism had to have something called life regulation, as we do, except it was simpler. 
And in those little creatures, already, the name that we can give to that simple regulation that is going on all around us is homeostasis. That's the, the way in which our life is naturally regulated, and it's a very basic process, and it's a process on which we do not interfere. The same way that right now, our hearts are beating, our lungs are functioning, our gut is working, uh, we have secretion of certain molecules into our bloodstream, and so forth, and none of that is actually known directly to us. It's going automatically, and it's a good thing because it has been fine-tuned over all those billions of years. However, at a certain point, something quite magic happened, is that organisms became able to feel what was going on in their inside, in their mind. And so we had the mental experience of our state of life, and that is exactly what is called a feeling. That is what is called, in fact, a conscious feeling, because feelings of necessity are conscious. Now, just think of the beauty of this. Even if you don't know all the details, this is an incredible transformation, because now it begins to give the opportunity for creatures very complex like us to have a say on what we can do. It's not just that life is being regulated automatically without us saying anything about it. We have the possibility of saying, no, I can do this or I cannot do this. And think also of the complexity that this brings. There are things that we will do that will be good and will be an advantage to us, but there are also things that we may do that are not so good. So, in fact, we have been given a gift that we have to be careful with, because it can be extremely positive to us, or it can, in fact, be not so good, and we have to watch out for what is happening with it. Now, one thing that I wanted, since I have the opportunity of you listening to me, one thing that I want you to be very clear about is the distinction between what goes on in the regular life regulation and what goes on when we actually know that that life regulation is there. And the best way of explaining that is with the fundamental distinction between what is an emotion and what is a feeling. Because remember, happiness is a state, is a mood, is a feeling that we have but it comes from a variety of emotions that are occurring in our bodies along with a variety of drives and motivations. So what is this difference and why is it that I am insisting on establishing this difference? It's quite simple. It's that when we have an emotion, imagine it as if it were music. You've been listening to a lot of music today. Imagine it as a, a melody that you are constructed, that is of a particular shape with a certain composition, and that involves instruments that are, in fact, in your body. By the way, those instruments, could, you could have the heart as an instrument, the gut as another instrument, the lungs, the, the face, all of those instruments are being used to play a certain concert. And that concert is what you describe as fear or joy or sadness, for example. So what is happening is really something that is a collection of actions and that has existed for all of the time that there has been complex life on Earth. When you have a feeling, you have something very different. You have something that is happening inside you, in your mind, but is in fact not public. So the fundamental dis distinction that I want you to make is between something which is the music, that is actions, that is being played, and that is public, and the feeling, which is internal, it's something that only you have, it's personal, and you can tell people about your feelings, but they will not know by looking at you. They can guess, but they don't know for sure. So, that's very important. And the other thing that I don't want you to walk out of here without thinking about is that all of these feelings that I'm talking about and all of these emotions have something that is called valence. In other words, they're not indifferent experiences. They're experiences that are either positive or negative, pleasant or unpleasant, agreeable or disagreeable. And this is totally revolutionary. Why? Because it's giving you not a placid, indifferent representation of the world 
or of your insides. It's giving you a representation that is, in fact, quite realistic. It's giving you the state of your life. It's telling you if things are going well or not. And if things are not going well, what you have is the opposite of happiness, which is, in fact, something that you could call sadness and sometimes depression. And so I wanted to and by calling your attention to the vulnerability and the fragility of happiness and how much you need to cultivate it. It's not something that you can just expect will come to you without you making an effort. You make an effort and you will be able to use it as a tool to achieving health, to achieving a better state of life for yourself. But there are many ways in which it can slide away and if it slides away, it reveals, as I said, sadness and in some cases depression. And I want to make the point that, of course, it's not that we have full control of this. Sometimes that control is limited. It may be that you go into sadness or you go into depression, for example, because you have genes that are controlling your behavior in a way that you are not fully conscious and the, you cannot, there's nothing at a certain point that you can be deliberate about. But this is not necessarily the case and you need to be armed to deal with those situations. And the, the other thing that I would like to say is that this is an uphill battle and once you have this huge possibility of knowing about ourselves and cultivating the knowledge about ourselves and cultivating the knowledge about the others, I would say that you can use happiness as an instrument and you can use something that I would call the pursuit of happiness, which by the way is something that people have done for a long time. The idea of the pursuit of happiness is something that has been engraved in constitutions, in declarations uh, of human rights in, historically for um, several hundred years and is in fact in a way implicit in a lot of historical classical uh, writings. And this is something that you can pursue, but with one very important proviso. Once again, because we are not alone individuals, because we are part of a social fabric, because we are inserted in cultures, what we do when we pursue our own happiness and when we try to offset all the vagaries and many of, very often all the things that can go wrong in one's life, what you do needs to take into account the pursuit of happiness that others may have. So you pursue happiness in a way, of course, to protect yourself because we are all in part selfish and we have to be, but in a way that also takes into account the pursuit of happiness of others. And the two, the two uh, goals have to be negotiated, have to be managed. And that, of course, is extremely complex to do, but it is not impossible to do. In fact, I would say that the reason why we have cultures, the reason why we are preoccupied with ideas and we can have meetings like this, is that we, we humans that have both the possibility of feeling, of knowing what is pain and suffering and knowing what is pleasure and the prospect of happiness, we have been able to construct with our intellectual capacity all the cultures that we know. We have been able to construct instruments of belief, instruments of uh, justice, instruments of, moral, uh, of, of morality, uh, governance, economics, uh, and so forth. And we have constructed the arts as well, which are very much part of, a, of this equation. And it is precisely because we have been able to do all that, that we have a way to deal, a forum to deal with all of these conflicts between the individual and the group. So thank you very much for your attention and be happy.